If you're having a little trouble with the picture on the TV now, maybe you just need to adjust the tracking on your VCR. We've been here before. The dark side of YouTube. A home to the disturbed and the tragic that goes well beyond just what we see on our screens. Police are investigating a deadly shooting. A side that shows us just how twisted humanity can really be. A side reserved by YouTube's darkest channels. Before we begin, this video is sponsored by Surfshark VPN. Anyone who has watched my channel knows that the internet is a dark place, so it's imperative to be protected when using it, which is where Surfshark comes in. Surfshark is a VPN that protects you from malware, tracking, and phishing attempts, assuring that your personal information is kept safely on your devices. You can try it now risk-free with their 30-day money-back guarantee. Just head over to surfshark.deal slash Nick Crowley and use the promo code Nick Crowley at checkout and you'll receive 83% off of a two-year plan along with three months added in free. Again, that's surfshark.deal slash Nick Crowley. Thank you again to Surfshark. <laughs> Admittedly, it doesn't look like much. In fact, the footage you're watching seems nothing shy of normal. A family spending the day out getting to see Thomas the Tank. It was all smiles and all laughter. On screen, we see the youngest member of the family, Ainsley Stapleton, and her older brother, McEwen. Behind the camera was their father, Matt. And here, here we see Kelly Stapleton and her daughter, Isabel, or Izzy for short. The video highlighted the family of five having one of their many fun days out of the house, with a video being posted to YouTube under the title, Stapleton's Day Out with Thomas. This clip went live all the way back in May of 2008, and would be the first of many videos posted to Kelly Stapleton's YouTube channel. And for the first two years of this channel's existence, many videos followed the same mold crudely edited clips showing the Stapleton family's wholesome moments. It's clear from these videos that the Stapleton family was a unit, even at times performing songs as a group together, and in many ways they all seemed like the perfect family. And it's likely that no one could have guessed the disturbing future that they were headed for. As 2010 came around, Kelly seemed to be growing less and less interested in sharing these family clips to YouTube. And by mid-July, the final video was posted before the channel appeared to be dropped for good. In the description, Kelly writes, Mom and autistic daughter finally danced together. This dance project was years in the making. The video shows the heartwarming moments of Kelly and Izzy dancing together on stage. This also served as the first confirmation throughout the channel that the Stapleton's daughter, Izzy, had autism, a fact that will prove crucial as the story continues. With that upload, Kelly Stapleton's channel fell dormant, and the small channel filled with precious family memories faded into oblivion. However, this wouldn't end up being the last time Kelly would post on YouTube as after a three year long break, the family would come back with a new string of videos. Videos that were a far cry from the wholesome content they had previously posted. On February 5th, 2013, Kelly would upload a 28 second long clip entitled Typical Day. And fair warning, it's disturbing. This video came as an absolute shock compared to the channel's previous content. 
as it seemed to show some kind of very real physical altercation. With Kelly clarifying in the description what was supposedly happening here. Kelly writes, My autistic daughter is aggressive. She was agitated and pulled my hair, then hit me several times. I was in the process of calling my husband for help when I must have hit the record button. This video is what happened next. And though this video shows us a glimpse at how bad things had gotten, it was Kelly's blog that had all the details. In it, she shares how Izzy had become physically abusive to members of the family, but especially with her with Kelly even sharing pictures from the hospital where she had to go thanks to one of Izzy's outbursts. And according to Kelly, she was only getting more violent. This was highlighted in the next video uploaded to the channel. Again, this clip shows Izzy acting violently, this time with staff at her residential facility. Around the time of these posts, a news program was actually made on the family story, shedding even more light on their upsetting situation. The story tells of how Izzy had been placed in a special home where she was receiving treatment, and there she had also been having these violent outbursts. It was clear that she needed more time and more treatment there, or perhaps a new form of treatment altogether. But ultimately, Kelly and Matt had ran out of money, and Izzy moved back home. She's gonna come home, and this is not gonna be pretty. Well, you said to me she's gonna kill you. She will. You feel that way? Yes. It's a very sad and twisted situation. A mom afraid of her own daughter. And it's made worse by the fact that this wasn't really Izzy's fault. She was a victim of her own mind, and she needed better treatment to aid with her violent outbursts. During Izzy's time at home, Kelly would make two more videos with her, with the final being titled Nightly Prayers, a video that featured no description and no comments. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Angel of God, my guardian dear, to whom God's love entrusts trust me here, in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. The video shows the mother and daughter praying together, and at a glance, it seemed like maybe Izzy's treatment was starting to work. But strangely enough, this would be the final post ever made to the channel. And in the past seven years, there's been no activity from the account, effectively marking the end of the Kelly Stapleton channel. It was also around this time that Kelly's blog became virtually inactive. So what ended up happening to the Stapleton family? And why did Kelly stop posting to her blog and to her channel? Well, surprisingly, it was all thanks to a camping trip. When you go camping, what do you have to do? You have to make some firewood, that's what campers do. It happened on September 3rd, 2013. Kelly approached Izzy and asked her to go on a mother-daughter camping trip. Izzy agreed, as Kelly had promised she could have as many s'mores as she wanted, which happened to be her favorite snack. So they drove out to a rural spot in Kenzie County, Michigan, and parked their van. There they sat by the fire as Izzy made s'more after s'more, something that I imagine must have made her incredibly happy. After some time, Izzy had got back in the van and sat in the front seat as her mom packed up their equipment in the back. In the trunk of the vehicle were two charcoal stoves that Kelly had brought for their night. So she grabbed them both and set them up in the back seat. She filled them with charcoal and one by one lit them up. Kelly got back in the vehicle and sat in the driver's seat next to Izzy. And as the smoke began to fill the car, she rolled up the windows and locked the doors. Izzy likely had no idea that this was never planned to be a night of camping. 
It was a planned murder-suicide, a plan hatched by her own mother. It seems that Kelly believed her daughter could no longer be helped, and she was tired of caring for her, and her plan was for the carbon monoxide to kill them both in the van so that neither of them had to deal with this anymore. And so they sat there and they waited as the poisonous gas slowly pushed them closer and closer to death. Kelly would send one final text to Matt before the two drifted off. When the world is over and the stars are shining bright, it's time to go to bed. It's time to say good night. How could it go from this to murder suicide? Upon receiving the first text, Matt immediately notified authorities, and the van would be found hours later. And by some miracle, Kelly and Izzy were both still breathing. It wouldn't take long for Kelly to completely recover, with cops waiting to arrest her as soon as she was discharged. But Izzy wasn't so lucky. The fumes had made her fall into a coma. But luckily, after three long days, she became responsive, suffering only minor long-term brain injuries. Today, Kelly is still serving time in prison, and Izzy has continued receiving treatment. And one of the most shocking parts of the aftermath to me was the public's response to Kelly. The comments on her videos are filled with overwhelming support for those who agreed with her decision to try and kill her own daughter, with one user saying, I agree 100%, I would put that animal up, and you did absolutely everything possible. You should be proud of all you tried to do for Izzy and all you accomplished. I for one support you and understand why you did what you did. It's all very disturbing, and though the family was in a tough spot, they could have turned to foster care, group homes, new medication, or even just a new treatment plan. As in the time following the event, the family has been highly criticized for using a treatment plan that is known to cause agitation and anger. There was a lot more that could have been done, rather than murder your own child and rob her of the rest of her life. Kelly Stapleton's channel will forever serve as proof that there's more than what meets the eye. The family seemed perfect, but in reality, they were more troubled than most. This is a theme that I've seen throughout YouTube, channels who attempt to follow this mold. They make themselves look loving, caring, and perfect to cover up their true darkness. And typically, you can find these channels leached onto the most wholesome of genres so that no one would suspect them, with family channels being the latest rabbit hole that I've fallen down. And though a channel such as Daddy05 may have been talked to death and listed as public enemy number one, there is surprisingly a lesser known channel, one that was much, much worse. Back in June of 2012, the first video was posted to the Fantastic Adventures channel, a channel that would feature a variety of kids-friendly content, mostly in the form of skits. The channel featured seven children, all between the ages of six to 15, and behind the scenes, it was run by their adopted mother, Michelle Hobson, who would orchestrate the skits, the editing, and the posting of the actual videos along with her two older biological sons who also helped out. And when you see the content, it seems so similar to what so many others are doing nowadays, a family making goofy, lighthearted skits made for children. And much like many channels in this genre, it pulled an incredible amount of views. Throughout its lifespan, the channel gained over 800,000 subscribers and a staggering 250 million views. Young kids were absolutely loving this content, and parents likely viewed it as a wholesome family-run account. However, what many didn't know was that behind the scenes, a storm was brewing. It 
It's now come forward that, for years, neighbors were suspicious of the activities taking place in the house. It's unclear what exactly they had seen or heard, but we know that people in the neighborhood had reported Michelle to the Department of Child Safety 15 separate times. That alone is a major indication that something wasn't quite right with the family-run channel. But ultimately, the reports didn't lead to anything, and the family continued operating their page, which meant more money going straight to Michelle's pockets, with the channel's revenue being as high as $3 million per year. Things were looking great for the channel, as the family was nothing shy of a success story. A story that, in March of 2019, revealed its biggest plot twist. It was around this time that Michelle's biological daughter, Megan, had noticed some concerning signs with the kids. Megan was no longer living with her mother when they operated the channel, but she would often visit and occasionally even appear in the family sketches. And on these visits, she started to realize that many of the children showed signs of abuse. And so, concerned for her adopted siblings, Megan decided to call authorities and report the potential abuse. And... It's a good thing she did. Police would end up making a welfare check at the house that revealed the shocking abuse the children were being put through. The welfare check showed that the kids had been forced into making these YouTube videos, to the point where Michelle had actually pulled the majority of them out of school so that they would have more time to create content. If one of the kids refused to participate, they would be beaten with belts and coat hangers and even Michelle's own fists. The same would be done to the kids if they stuttered or messed up one of their lines. It's absolutely appalling, and the fact that each of these children were adopted makes one question if this channel was her motive for adopting so many kids so that she could use them to create content. But the abuse is far worse than just what I've told you. When police entered the home, they found each of the children to be extremely malnourished, being starved and dehydrated. One kid was also found trapped inside of a dark closet with a diaper on, which was supposedly one of their usual punishments. In Michelle's room, there was a closet that had a deadbolt lock on the outside. The children would be put inside of there and locked in the darkness for days without food, water, or even a place to use the bathroom. They would either have to go in diapers or on the floor. And all this was done if they were reluctant in any part of the filming process. And the punishments continue. They would also be forced into taking ice baths. And if they tried to get out, Michelle would hold their heads underwater for extended periods of time, nearly to the point of drowning these kids. A few of the boys had also told police that Michelle had forcefully grabbed them by their private parts and pinched them so hard to the point that they'd bleed. It's absolutely horrendous to imagine, and it's not even the worst punishment they'd face. Michelle also kept multiple cans of pepper spray in the house, and when the children would misbehave, she would spray them. And not just a little bit, she would cover their entire body from head to toe, with one of the adopted daughters reporting that Michelle had even sprayed her inside of her private area, which put her in extreme pain for days. It's unimaginable, and all this abuse was orchestrated by Michelle to virtually make her adopted children slaves to work on this YouTube channel and make her millions. This revelation instantly made this channel one of the darkest on the platform, with it being so twisted that YouTube ended up terminating it not long after the news had broken. If only they took that kind of action with some other accounts. But to add to this morbid story, Michelle would never end up serving a prison sentence. Good evening and thanks for joining us. We're starting with breaking news. Michelle Hobson, the Maricopa woman accused of abusing her adopted kids and forcing them to perform on YouTube videos, died earlier today.
Hobson has been sick for a while. She suffered a brain injury while in custody months ago and had missed several court dates. She ended up passing away in November of that year before she could ever face any real consequence. In a story so dark and twisted, Michelle's biological daughter, Megan, was the true hero. She ended up adopting two of the kids with the others being placed in foster care. And without her, this abuse would likely still be happening because no one would know. It's a shame that Michelle's twisted truths didn't come out any sooner as they remained hidden in the shadows for years. But this isn't always the case. Some channels will do their best to try and hide their dark backstories, but their attempts don't even last a day, with people immediately questioning their legitimacy. But as we'll see from our final channel, even then, it's oftentimes too late. Which brings us to our final story, the story of Russian pop singer Zilyam Bekev. Born in Chechnya, Bekev grew up with a passion for singing, and those around him knew that he had the voice to make it big. And by 2017, he had already managed to make quite a name for himself in the Russian music scene, scoring a number of hit songs. And all this was accomplished at the age of just 25, making it clear that he had an incredibly promising future ahead. A future that would take a sudden and mysterious detour in August of that year. On the 6th of August, Bekev had flown into Grozny to attend his sister's wedding. The special moment was a break in the never-ending grind to make it as a famous singer. But despite the time off, he would soon have to leave for Moscow to attend a talent competition. He would never make it there. Because on the 8th of August, Bekev went out to explore Grozny after the wedding and never came back. With his phone being shut off and all of his social media accounts being deactivated. Bekev was at the peak of his career. He was living the life he had always dreamed of, and he just disappeared without a trace or an explanation. Did he run away and start a new life, or was he taken? Nobody knew as the case became a widespread mystery throughout the region, and it wouldn't go without answers for long as a break would quickly come in the form of two eyewitnesses who had claimed to have seen exactly what happened to Bekev. On the evening of August 8th, 2017, two bystanders had witnessed the singer acting in a calm and casual manner. As the bystanders watched, they would witness Bekev as he was approached by SOBR security forces, a rapid reaction military group a group that typically handles terrorist threats and other major cases like that. The witnesses claim that after being confronted by the group, Bekev was then placed in handcuffs, put in the vehicle, and driven off, never to be seen again. A seemingly normal looking singer being detained by a military group, it just didn't make any sense. What kind of risk could this young man have posed and even more strangely, in the days following the alleged arrest, the Chechen government denied these reports and stated that Bekev had not actually been arrested. All this despite the fact that the eyewitnesses were proven to be credible. So what's with the secrecy, and where did Bekev end up? Well, as it turns out, the young pop singer may have found himself in a concentration camp. It's a shocking idea, and without context, it certainly sounds crazy, but it might actually make sense. At the time of his disappearance, it was said that a shockingly high number of gay men had mysteriously vanished from the region, with many of their whereabouts still being unknown. Because of this, there were rumors floating around Chechnya that gay men in the country were being secretly abducted and held at concentration camps in the area. 
camps where the victims would be tortured in an attempt to either kill them or turn them straight. And as strange as this all sounds, it's actually true. We turn now to a story causing global outrage out of the Russian Republic of Chechnya. A coordinated government campaign to round up and eliminate gay men. He says he was detained for more than a week, then starved and brutally tortured. It's said that there are frequent purges in the area to rid Chechnya of homosexuality, where victims are abducted by government-led groups and brought to these camps. Those who are sent there are not only tortured, but oftentimes forced into straight marriages or even into killing themselves. Now, on a few occasions, it's also said that a few of the victims are sent home to their families, which should be a good thing. Well, apparently not, as they are only sent home on the condition that their own families kill them. It's a disturbing and twisted thing that is likely happening right now as we speak, with practically no news coverage here in the US. And truthfully, this whole situation would warrant its own video, so I won't go that far into detail. But nonetheless, these purges are really happening. And as you might have guessed, Bekev was openly gay himself, and he had found himself in Chechnya during the peak of one of these purges. He was also extremely recognizable given his star status, making him an easy target for the military group to abduct. With many assuming this to be the reason for Bekev's disappearance, it seemed likely that he was killed in one of these camps, as it's said that many people who go there don't make it out. Now, though this story is incredibly dark, you may be wondering, what does this have to do with YouTube? as after all, the singer didn't even have his own channel. Well, this would all change on September 24th of 2017, when Bekev would show the world that he wasn't actually missing, and that he apparently wasn't trapped in an anti-gay concentration camp either. On that day, Bekev would upload a video to a brand new YouTube channel, supposedly showing that he was doing well, and that he was now living in Germany. He explains how he gave up his life as a singer and had taken up a simpler, more stress-free life. The channel itself consists of just two uploads, both coming on the same day and showing the now former singer dancing and laughing and just appearing to have a good time. It was great news, he seems happy, and it proves that he was alive and not actually in danger. And at least the clips would provide some closure for his family and stop the spread of this rumor. However, as I mentioned previously, it's easy to hide behind a screen and make everything seem perfect. But there's always those who can see right through it. Immediately upon the video's release, loved ones of Bekev claimed that he had been acting completely out of character in these videos. In many instances, his speech and his movements feel strained. <laughs> and there are quite a few examples of seemingly fake laughter. <laughs> and by the second video, he even starts dancing, but you can tell that he seems to be slightly uncomfortable by doing so. Also, there are moments where Bekev is clearly reading off of a script, an idea that could explain his strange behavior. The way Bekev was acting was suspicious, and it wasn't just his behavior, it was also what he was saying. At one point, he says something that translates to, it's kind of the middle of August, I go to Germany, everything is in our hands. But in actuality, the video was posted at the end of September, a long ways off from kind of the middle of August. Another indication that this was a scripted video that had potentially been recorded over a month ago. 
But even if it was scripted and recorded earlier, it still shows us that Bekev is safe, right? I mean, he's in Germany after all, far away from the persecution of the Chechen government. Well, analyzing the room further, this point might not actually be true. Just looking at the room, many have noticed that its features are not consistent to a home in Germany. The ceiling, air conditioning vent, wallpaper, and lighting design all don't seem to line up. As from a design perspective, you would be hard pressed to find any interior like it in Germany, as it's typically never seen in European homes. And rather, this interior design most closely resembles a home from Chechnya. Along with this, both the chair and the couch shown in the footage are Russian made. So between the bad acting and the seemingly off location, it's clear that something suspicious is going on here. A notion that may actually have been confirmed by an energy drink. In the clips, we see a bunch of drinks out on the table of where Bekev is sitting, with one of them being a bottle of Drive M7 energy drink. Now this is significant given the fact that this beverage isn't even sold in the German market. However, it's a common staple in Chechnya, a fact that would later be confirmed by PepsiCo themselves. And many have also pointed out that the other drinks on the table are clearly not German as well. With this information coming out, it's all but been confirmed that these two videos that supposedly show a free man are completely fake. Now making things even more suspicious, this video came out just 10 days after Bekev's mother had publicly called out the Chechen president about her son's disappearance, an event that caused a minor media frenzy. With all this said, it seems highly likely that Bekev was forced into making these videos by Chechen authorities in order to calm the public's suspicion. And there's a disturbing note to consider if this is true. Remember when Bekev said it's kind of the middle of August, despite the video being posted in late September? Well, maybe the video actually was filmed all the way back in mid-August, and authorities were holding on to it to release if suspicions ever got high. Which, as we know, at the time the videos were released, Bekev's own mother was calling out the government and getting all the media involved. So by the time these videos were posted, there was a very likely chance that they were already a month old. Which means that throughout that time, Bekev was likely being beaten and tortured at a concentration camp where people supposedly didn't last very long. So when this channel was started and these two videos were released, it seems highly likely that Zilliam Bekev was already dead. It's clear that YouTube can be quite a disturbing platform at times, with many of its darkest channels hiding behind masks, and I can only imagine how many more there are out there, hiding in plain sight, just waiting for us to uncover. I want to give a special shout out to my gold tier patrons, as well as my god tier patrons, Eduardo, Lacey, Michelle Scaraccio, and Nathan Backus. Thank you so much, guys, and I'll leave a link down below to my Patreon if anyone else would like to join.